He is an international senior executive with, I would say, deep insights in e-commerce, digital marketing, and retail. His name is Terry von Bibra, and he's the vice president to Europe for Alibaba. Please join me on stage. There he is. <laughs> Thank you, Lars. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for that, because you've clearly <laughs> yeah, right. prepped the two well. Yeah. Much uh, appreciated. My performance, you don't have to do that. You no, can, no, no, you can do your not thing. Not my style. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a real um, pleasure to be here, an honor to be here at the inaugural Connex. And I'd like to thank uh, Pedro, Luisa, Jose, the whole Travelgate team for putting this on. I think in the years to come, we will all look back and say, I was there at the first Connex. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's the direction this is going. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about China, about my company, Alibaba, our Fliggy travel business, and a few things. I'm going to start with, with, with China. So, you know, China, everyone knows China is, is very large, um, the 1.4 billion population. But to really put that into perspective, um, for China, 731 million people online. That's essentially the entire population of Europe, 100% online. Uh, more relevant, though, for our subject today, travel is the 300 million Chinese middle class. These are the people who have the disposable income and the desire to spend money on quality products and on quality experiences, including travel. That number is growing to 600 million middle class in the next five years. Another way I look at China and try to get a sense of that scale are cities. Cities with a population of one million or more. Here in Europe, there are 18 cities with a population of one million. This is the London, Madrid, Paris of this world, 18. In China, 160, that's forecasted to grow to 220 cities in the next 10 years. When it comes to travel, China obviously is already one of the largest outbound travel markets, um, but what's particularly interesting to me is how that scale, as China becomes the number one outbound market, but how big the difference is going to be to the number two and number three of this world. China is also uh, going to be the largest domestic market. There are four and a half billion trips domestically. That's going to six and a half billion uh, in the next four years. In China, we have eight million college graduates every year. So people in this core target audience for traveling abroad. I want to touch briefly on the Chinese consumer. And the reason is the Chinese consumer has a very different background than, than most of the people in this room. Most of us in this room, having grown up uh, here in Europe or in the US in my case, we grew up in a world in which we were constantly exposed to brands. We grew up and learned about brands um, intuitively in our family's households. So in your family households, you know, your parents didn't have smartphones, perhaps. The cars they drove looked differently, but we all experienced brands as a way to choose to make your consumer choices in the world. That is not the case with the Chinese consumers of today. The Chinese consumers go back one generation, had very, very little choice, very little exposure to brands. So when it came to the generation today, they couldn't look to their parents, they couldn't look to how they grew up. And it means that when it comes to great brands, the Chinese consumer really wants to understand why is this brand important? Why do Europeans choose this brand over another brand? What's the history of the brand? They're fascinated by this idea that there's brands here in Europe that have been around for 100 years. Why is that brand still around? Why is it special? Very important message when you think about your brand connecting to China. That's led to a situation where the Chinese consumer today is the most sophisticated and most demanding consumer, in my opinion, in the world. Those consumers, these tourists, they have um, very specific um, interests. Some of them are not surprising. Very much focused on beauty and uniqueness when choosing outbound travel locations. Of course, they're interested in safety, um, easy, easy visa procedures. That's something I'm working on quite a bit with my, my teams in Fliggy and Alipay. How do we make it easier for Chinese tourists to get visas? Um, and they're looking for a welcoming environment, um, not surprising. The traveling tourists on our platform, Fliggy, are also very young. 58% 
of our users were born after 1990. So this is really a social media focused platform, Fliggy, focused on millennials and how they want to choose their travel experience. Some of the things they're interested in, again, experiencing unique places. They'd love to be the first person in their social group to go to a special location, to be able then to share during the trip and after the trip on social media what made that location special. To come to a place like this, for example, to say, this is not where everyone else has been. Their parents have gone to, to France, seen the Eiffel Tower. They've probably done that before, too. So the travels that they're planning now are much more about unique experiences, experiencing something like a local, great food, unique experiences, taking the time to actually enjoy that. It's a very different away from large groups to small FIT people groups really wanting to experience something special. I'll talk briefly about the Alibaba uh, group. Um, we are uh, a company with many, many different business activities, uh, 636 million um, active users. Um, we generate about 69 million packages a day, but we don't actually ship those packages ourselves. One of the important things to understand about Alibaba is we're very much about partnership. There are 1.5 million people delivering packages from our platform every day in China, they do not work for us. They work for the hundreds of logistics companies that we work for as partners. It's a very important theme about how Alibaba works. 768 billion GMV, that's not our revenue, that's the gross merchandise volume. This is the value of goods, be it fast-moving consumer goods, or air tickets, or hotel bookings, or any other product that our partners are transacting on our site. That's how we look at our business. What is the business that our partners are doing on our platform? 90% um, of our sales are on mobile. China is not about mobile first. China is mobile only. It's the only way that a Chinese consumer is experiencing, looking, searching for brands, and planning their travel. Um, and we have at any given day about a billion products and services listed on our platforms. We're quite well known for the uh, Double Eleven Shopping Festival, known as Singles Day, uh, 11th of November every year. This last Singles Day, we did $30.8 billion of GMV within 24 hours. Uh, over 180,000 brands participated, many of those international brands. 200,000 smart stores, so physical stores, who were enabled to participate in this event. Um, and we generated about 1 billion packages on that day. Also in the travel industry, uh, over a million tickets uh, sold, over 1,000 trips booked to Antarctica. Um, the numbers are really quite astounding because of all the, the energy that comes together on this special, special shopping day. In terms of our goals as Alibaba, <clears throat> we've set ourselves a goal by 2036 to be serving 2 billion consumers. That number is very important because although China is very large, we could never achieve that goal by simply focusing on China. So we basically set ourselves a goal to force us to say we really, really want to become a more global company and serve consumers all over the world. Um, we want to have 10 million profitable partner companies working on our platform. We already work with 10 million uh, companies today, but for us it's very important that they are profitable in their business models using our platform. And the last goal is we want to create 100 million jobs. Again, not our own employees, but through our ecosystem. We've already created over 36 million jobs in the ecosystem. Our goal is to create 100. The mission of the company is very simple. We want to make it easy to do business anywhere. We do so many different things, from B to B to C to C to C to B, from travel and cloud services and financial services. But the one thing that ties all that together is this mission. How do we make it easy to do business? How do we help sellers easily connect to buyers? That's what we're about. We look at our businesses as the global five. Global buy, enabling brands from Europe and America to be bought by the Chinese consumers, by these 300 million Chinese middle class. Global sale is where we enable Chinese products to be sold throughout the world. Uh, global delivery I talked about with packages. Important for us today, though, is, is global fund and global pay. Global fund for us is our travel business. It's the combination of the Fliggy app with the Alipay payment method to enable the Chinese traveler to have the best possible travel experience as they do more and more outbound travel. Our approach, be it about e-commerce, be it about retail, be it about the travel industry, it's always about three things, which is scale, partnership, 
in innovation. When I say scale, I'm thinking of the scale of China, the numbers we were looking at before, the scale of the Alibaba ecosystem, the scale of the travel industry. For partnership, as I mentioned, we're all about enabling others. We see ourselves as a platform, or really more, we are a platform of platforms, doing many, many different ways, always focused on enabling partners to connect, sellers and buyers to connect. And innovation, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment, is very important to us about how we approach innovation. And let me talk about that. So, <clears throat> when it comes to innovation, many people think about things like um, big data, ever more sophisticated algorithms, artificial intelligence. These are the typical words that come to mind with innovation. We do all of those things. Uh, artificial intelligence, I had the pleasure recently of having a colleague explain to me the difference between a normal chip and an artificial intelligence chip because we also produce uh, AI chips. If someone's interested, I'm happy to, uh, to ex try to explain that in one of the breaks. But my point is that isn't really what innovation's about. Many companies have big data. Many companies are designing very sophisticated algorithms and everyone's using artificial intelligence. That really isn't the point. The point about innovation when it comes to how I would say we as Alibaba see that is really what are you trying to do when you innovate? So the example I wanted to show here of, of innovation, I would consider this to be the absolute cutting edge of innovation. What you're seeing here, it may not look sophisticated, it certainly doesn't look sexy. This is a mom and pop store in China. Mom and pop stores play such a critical role, have played such a critical role in retail throughout the world. Um, when I started in e-commerce 20 years ago, many people said, how are mom and pop stores going to survive? How can they compete with these giant companies with their, their, uh, their ability to invest, with their technology, with their platform, with their scale? And in fact, in many countries here in Europe, mom and pop stores have disappeared. Here in Spain, the ultramarinos have gone from 95,000 to 25,000. Most countries, they have disappeared. But in China, they have not. In China, there are six million mom and pop stores. So when I see that as being cutting-edge innovation, it's because our company said, we don't want to eliminate these companies. We don't want to put them out of business. We don't want to replace them. We don't want to increase e-commerce's market share. We want to help them serve their customers better. And that's what we're doing. So we go to these mom-and-pop stores. We're working with a very large number uh, of that six million. We go to them and say, you know your customers. They come into your store twice a day, on the way to the work, on the way back to work. We're going to give you access to data about what the people in your neighborhood are buying on our platforms. And what you'll see is some of those products you sell and some you don't. Then we build a platform where you can buy those products from our marketplace to sell to your store. You have a challenge with logistics to get those products into your store. We're going to help you with logistics. Do you have help, uh, challenges with branding or other areas? We'll help you with that. So innovation for us is saying, here's an important retail channel in which millions of people work and many more millions of people use every day. How are we going to use technology, our scale, our insights to help them serve their customers better? That is true innovation. Technology is secondary, but how we help them is not. So, you know, this all comes down to the idea of e-commerce. We're seen as an e-commerce platform. We are technically the largest e-commerce platform in the world, but that's not how we see ourselves. Um, the reason for that is uh, something our founder, Jack Ma, recently said. That he says e-commerce is going to disappear. Why is it going to disappear? It's for exactly the reasons I was just explaining. We believe that consumers do not care about whether they purchase something online or offline. A traveling consumer does not care if he books his hotel online or offline or any other way. He cares, she cares about the convenience, the price, the availability. Is it easy to find what they're looking for? What was the experience like before, during, and after their trip? And for that, offline and online, the distinction between offline and online is irrelevant. So what we're doing, the example I just mentioned about uh, corner shops, mom and pop stores, we're doing this across 10 different retail channels. As you can see behind me, I won't go into all of them, but in each one, the channel is different, the needs of the consumers, the needs of the businesses there are different, and for each one we're going in and saying, how can we help you innovate, do omni-channel retail, uh, get away from this idea of online and offline in your, in your business. 
Talking briefly about our travel business, Flicky, um, when we got into the travel business, our CEO was very clear. He says, look, we don't need another business unit. We have about 49 business units. So we don't need to go in and say, we're going to go in and get in the travel business when we entered this space four years ago. If we're going to do it, we have to do it differently. And that's what we did. We went in and said, um, we don't want to simply be another OTA. There's plenty of good OTAs in China and all over the world. That's great. We see ourselves as a marketplace. As I'm sure you've noticed throughout the speech, our whole idea is about being a marketplace enabling. So we see ourselves much more as an online travel marketplace. How do we bring the seller and the buyer together? That's what we're doing. And then we use innovation in a way to make it easier. One example of innovation is what we call post-post-pay. So we're all familiar when, when traveling privately, um, get out your credit card to book the hotel online, get out your credit card again when you check into the hotel, maybe get out your credit card again when you check out. It's quite a hassle. What we said is we don't need to do that because technology enables us to make it easier. So when someone books their travel on Fliggy, we already have their Alipay account. Every Fliggy account is connected to an Alipay account, which means he doesn't need to pull out anything. He simply books the hotel and doesn't ever enter any type of payment method. When he gets to the hotel, he doesn't need to go through a check-in process. He's already checked in, doesn't need to pull out his credit card. He simply uh, checks into the hotel. And when he or she leaves, they don't need to say, OK, what were the incidentals? No one needs to check the minibar. They simply walk out, express checkout, or simply walk out, because the hotel already, from the day of booking, has all the payment detail. They will check the incidentals after you leave, and they will simply bill that to your Fliggy account. So very easy for the traveler, very cost efficient and secure financing for the hotel. We're doing this with 100,000 hotels in China, doing it with about 1,000 hotels outside of China, and something we're planning to increase because it's very good for both the buyer and the seller. Another type of innovation we're doing is with loyalty programs. Loyalty programs, such a standard um, uh, channel and such a standard way of how to help uh, hotel chains to build their business. We looked at loyalty programs and we said, you know, it's difficult in China because in a country like the US, for example, uh, loyalty pro uh, hotel chains make up about 50% of room nights booked. So as part of a loyalty program, one of the key things is that people know if I'm a loyalty program uh, member of this program, I'm going to find a hotel from that chain in most cities I go into. And much of the interaction when it comes to loyalty program actually happens at the counter when I check in. Would you like to become a member? We're going to give you an upgrade because you're a member. Hotel chains in China only representing 8% of room nights do not have that opportunity. Outside of a tier one city, many of these hotel chains are also not present, which means they need a way to be able to acquire new members and to engage with those members. And what we've done with Fliggy is we then merge our Fliggy loyalty program with hotel chains programs to say, we have tier matching, membership matching, there's still two programs, but suddenly these programs can engage directly with the millennials on our platform in a way that they want to be engaged with, which is strictly on the smartphone. It's proven to be very successful in helping programs to acquire members. The members they are acquiring are not only acquired efficiently, they're also spending more and staying more and engaging more with the program. So it's something where we see taking a standard, traditional um, icon from the travel industry but doing it in a way that actually works best for the Chinese millennial traveler. The um, last example I wanted to give of innovation is something called the Fly Zoo Hotel. Um, we built this hotel, uh, opened it last December. I, I need to say, first of all, we are not getting into the hotel business. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, the hotel is very much for us a test. We believe the same thing we've done for these mom and pop stores in China or in other retail channels, we believe the same thing needs to be done for the hotel business. And the best way to do that is to test it. So we built this hotel, it's right next to our campus, um, and we're using technology to sort of push the limits and test how does a, a traveler of the future want to engage with a hotel. So the first thing is they can check in on their app. So there are no counters to check into. They simply check into their app before they arrive, when they arrive. They then are using facial recognition. So um, I was there myself recently. Um, I'm a little bit old-fashioned, so I, I made sure I got a, a, a room key just in case. But I never actually used it. I never once had to pull out my room key. Facial recognition in the elevator lets me go to my floor. 
Facial recognition opens my door. It did work every time. I was really testing it. Um, every room has a Tmall Genie in it. That's the uh, uh, Alexa-type project uh, that we have. So that in every room, people can use the Tmall Genie to control uh, the room, air conditioning, uh, curtains, and everything like that. And my favorite, um, these little robots. Um, so this is a bit challenging for me. I actually took these pictures myself. I don't speak Chinese, so that was a bit tricky uh, with the Tmall Genie and other stuff, and this robot only speaks Chinese, but I had some of my colleagues help me. I ordered a room service to my room. This little guy comes up the elevator all on his own, walks down the hallway. I open the door to see if he's coming. It's a bit slow, but he, he was making it. Um, I shut the door quickly before he got there because I wanted to test the experience. And then he um, rang my doorbell. I opened the door. I was sent a four-digit code on the app. I open the app, uh, and it gives me my uh, green tea dessert because I don't want the guy next door to me taking my dessert, you know, just because he captured the, uh, the robot there. So it was a fun experience. Does that mean that we believe every hotel will be like it in the future? Not necessarily. It's about testing the ideas. It's about trying to figure out what's the operating system of a hotel in the future going to look like. Many people are concerned about people. Um, actually, we employ just as many people as a hotel of this size, that's 200 rooms, would normally employ. The people are the same, but we've got people working on what they can do better, and we're letting technology do what can technology can do well. That's the whole idea. So um, I'll close with that. For us, when you think about it, Scale, partnership, and innovation. Innovation to test, to push the boundaries, to discover better ways of connecting the buyer and the seller. Thank you very much. So, excellent. Yeah, right. There was uh, one twist and shout. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, very right. good. We like him. Uh, okay, so we have some Slack questions. Thank you for that. I hope some good ones came in. Terry, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I've got a, a strong one to start with. Uh oh, okay. Uh, what's the best approach to get a deal with Alibaba? <laughs> to, to get a deal with Alibaba? How does Alibaba get a deal with you? Ah, uh, nice. We are, we are interested in working with you. The best way is to speak to me in one of the breaks. Uh, and explain to me what are your ambitions for China, what are you doing in China, what would you like to do in China, and how can we help? Good answer. Applause. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and next one. How are brands targeting their audiences with their specific control policies? How are they targeting audiences when it comes to, uh, to data? Yeah. You really want me to have to put on my glasses? Oh, sorry. sorry. It's all right. It's all right. You know, so we, we do use a lot of um, targeting, like any large uh, platform. Advertising is actually how we make our money. So um, we charge commission fees in many places, but we really make our, our revenue, our profit, by people wanting to advertise on our platform. So we have very sophisticated targeting, mm -hmm. um, but um, that's the same as anywhere. We use the data, we use people's preferences and behavior, but you have to do that in an extremely controlled way because data policy is important to consumers everywhere, but also legally in China, same as here as anywhere else, very strictly controlled. So okay. we use data to do targeting, um, but in a way that is uh, both accepted to the consumer and conform with the, uh, the country. Okay. Uh, you talked about 2036 aspirations. How do you balance short and long term? Mm -hmm. So it's, Big one. It's, it's a good question because it is quite, I think, one of the most common challenges I've noticed in companies I've worked at is how do they manage to focus on the long term? I've worked at companies who had an incredible long term vision. I've worked at companies who would like to work long term but simply couldn't afford to because of the pressure of quarterly results. Uh, but I've never worked at a company like Alibaba where there is such an unusual combination of short term and long term. I have many, many colleagues, they are so focused on the next three months, very short term, and they are just like this I must achieve this goal in the next three months. And then you speak to our, our senior executives, and they're saying what they want to talk about is five years out, 10 years out. Jack Ma recently pulled a meeting. He pulled out a strategy deck that was 15 years old from a strategy conversation for 15 years and said, so, ladies and gentlemen, what have we achieved in the 15 years from our list? Let's make the list for the next 15 years. So it's a very unusual combination of many, many people working on short-term goals, but all of those are part of a very very clearly designed long-term vision. Wow. 
Uh, how do you see the potential for Alipay's growth outside China? We are very excited uh, about uh, Alipay's growth outside China. Uh, Alipay already has one billion users, so actually quite a few of those outside of China, um, uh, in India and other places. But what we're really focused on with Alipay is still about the Chinese consumer, but enabling them to use it anywhere in the world. We're very happy when we come to a country like Spain, that at El Corte Inglés, for example, it's very easy now to use Alipay. Um, you can go to open markets uh, in, my, in my hometown in Munich and buy fruit at the old medieval market using Alipay. But it's always for the Chinese consumer. Our focus still is on enabling those 600, 800 to billion Chinese consumers when they're traveling abroad to have the convenience of Alipay. Okay. I think we, uh, Lilian, do we have any? Oh, one more, one more is on the way. So. How did it feel standing here in this, uh, with this wonderful... It felt very good. I love this location, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, this is very much to my taste. Yeah, uh, really? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes yeah. Uh, I'd also like this to be my summer home, if you know. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We can share. Yes, we it's can a great share. location, great being up here <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the hills and outside of town. I'll take this room, you can have the other one. There. I'll, I'll, I'll take the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, All right. right. So here we go. Um, how do you get around hotels need for prepay when you are postpay? So if a hotel normally wants prepay, but if a hotel is working with us for Alipay, so these 100,000 hotels in China, 1,000 hotels outside of, once we've done the technical integration, they don't need prepay, they don't want prepay because the payment through Alipay is automatic and guaranteed. In fact, to go even further, when someone leaves the hotel, and I mentioned that incidentals would be, we'd be covered, the hotel doesn't need to worry, but wait, what if his Alipay account doesn't cover the incidentals? Mm. We guarantee it does, because we understand our users so well, we understand them through our relationship with Alipay so well, that we are able to take that risk. So the payment will happen either way, and the hotels know that, that we work with. So mm. hotels are no longer focused when they're working with post-postpay on prepay, they're focused on benefiting from that streamlined experience. Less work for them, guaranteed payment. Wow, yeah. I, I must say, I have to give you feedback uh, instantly. Like, your answer is just like, we prepared this. It's very nice. It, well, it works. <laughs> yeah, it yeah works. right, so, right. 100,000 hotels you is know a pretty stuff. good case that's study. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations to Alibaba, I would say. Uh, that's it. Okay. So, it's time for the twist and shout. Thank you, Terry. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Uh, so, to go this way. Yeah.